through how you first got Sid involved in that band the very first uh, time in Cambridge. You know, I met Sid through Jenny. He was living in Cambridge at the time in his mother's basement, I think. Jenny had known him a long, quite a long time um, and he was around in Cambridge. You'd see him walking around and he had this beautiful, I remember, black a sort of velvet suit um, you know, and um, really great go hill boots, you know, really sort of, and beautiful sort of shirts and flowered shirts. It was very, um, you know, he just looked like a rock star walking around, even though actually, if you know, I think he was also very afraid of any contact. And, you know, generally, even, even with people he knew, he, he was, he was, um, you know, didn't, didn't, Make I think he found contact with other people quite hard at that time. So you, it's, it's sort of strange, almost a contradiction, like to be so dressed so flamboyantly, so obviously looking like a rock star, and yeah. yet that shyness or you know withdrawing thing. Yeah, I, I it it um, I think it was a contradiction. I mean, he'd come along to Fisher House. He'd also come to our house, Jenny and I lived in a, a little cottage outside Cambridge in a place called Gravely and he'd come over there and we'd also meet him at a shop called What's In A Name run by a guy called Steve Brink um, and we, I think we, yeah, I, I, Twink would come there. I can't remember where Twink was living, he was in Cambridge. I think he was sort of in between Cambridge and London. He was, um, you know, also on and off playing with the Pink Fairies but um, so Sid would sort of come in and out, drift in and out of this loose connection of people. I think, you know, that, that Jenny knew him much better than I did. And I think he felt comfortable around Jenny. And because I was with Jenny at the time, he felt comfortable around me. He was, you know, it was sort of non, it was unthreatening, I think. Um, and, uh, yeah, so he'd, he'd spend time with us. and. You know, he, I can't remember if he actually got up and jammed with us at Fisher House. He certainly got up and, and played a gig that I was, did with an American blues singer called Eddie Burns. He was there and he, he played. I also remember him. We had a, Twink and I had a band called the Last, Last Minute Put Together Boogie Band, which was something that kind of came, um, sort of a, arose out of the situation I think at Fisher House where you know it was very sort of loose and jamming and yeah this guy Bruce was I forget his second name he was a guitarist and singer very good blues sort of singer in a kind of Greg Allman sort of mode um, and I remember we did a gig uh, supporting Hawkwind at the Corn Exchange and with the last minute put together boogie band and at one point we had the three of us plus Sid on guitar and Fred Frith uh, from Henry Cow also on guitar. I mean, you know, two different worlds on the guitar, really, right there. Um, possibly some other people as well. I, I think there probably were quite a few people on stage. I can't remember who they all were, but certainly I remember Sid and Fred being up there with us. Um, you know, and so I think that's how that's how Twink and I started playing with Sid. Um, Did you do any rehearsing, or was it just completely impromptu? I remember playing a bit with Sid in his mother's basement. Um, I can't remember if Twink was there or not. I mean, it certainly was... Uh, I do remember that you couldn't... I couldn't stand up in that basement. I don't think Sid could. I think he is taller than me. Um, and so I think it's probably unlikely that we had a drum kit down there. You know, I just remember sort of... I think it was probably just a couple of small amps and... Um, just yeah, it wasn't exactly a rehearsal um, playing yeah but yeah I suppose it was uh, playing through some songs in his basement I think we might have played together at, at our cottage at Gravely uh, I think we did rehearse at What's In A Name the shop um, that's that's all the rehearsals I can remember you know you, know, you talked about the um, playing in the tea room 
Can you, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I remember the, uh, the first gig, I, I, I'm fairly sure that the first gig that we did as stars was what I was playing, and I think Jenny, Jenny subsequently told me it was uh, somebody's wedding, but it was a what I'd describe as a cafe on or a tea room on East Road in Cambridge. It was very, again, very kind of alternative, you know, sort of moo tea and, you know, uh, sort of, I don't know about the hash cakes, but certainly cakes. Um, and probably we played... Hash cakes. Probably. Um, we played in the evening We at uh, this, you know, which well, I just remember it being a party or a, a, and a gig. Um, and it was great. I think we played two sets. We really enjoyed it. All I think, you know, all three of the musicians enjoyed it. And the audience enjoyed it. It was a really good event, good atmosphere. And that, that, as far as I remember, was our first and best gig. And what did people kind of recognise it? I mean, or was it just a, a group of musicians? I, th I think even then, Sid was a a a. a, a figure who was known locally you know and I mean I, I would have said that he was um, known you know certainly more widely than that he'd already been you know with Pink Floyd and they'd done the roundhouse and all that you know they had the record out and everything I mean he was certainly you know he was certainly well known and you know but he was also kind of recognised to be as being a local Cambridge sort of person as well but um I, I would have said he was certainly already a national or an international star by then, yeah. I think inevitably there was a lot of expectation around the band, um, just, you know, mainly because of Sid. I don't think it was particularly to do with me or Twink. Um, and so I think, you know, quite soon there was a pressure to well, you know, to to do the, the bigger gigs. I mean, we, as I said, we'd already, you know, been used to sort of, um, you know, doing support gigs with for you know bands at the Corn Exchange. So I suppose it was a kind of a natural development. It was also um, to do with a guy called Steve Brink, who was promoting things at the Corn Exchange at the time, and he was very, you know, energetic and and um, put a lot of effort into into putting things on and we knew him did you th have a sense that this might be might be grow into something with Sid in the band I think I think it was like any band you you don't start a band unless you you know unless you want to sort of uh, play to people and you know ho hopefully you know sell some records and have some success so I don't I don't think I for myself that um that there was anything more than a normal desire to be, yeah, to start a band and, and kind of make it, you know. Um, you know, I, 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 w I think I was, you know, obviously aware that Sid was already an established name. But, um, yeah. Um, tell us about the, the, the last concert. It was certainly a Steve Brink production, MC5 were on the bill. <laughs> I just remember being in the dressing room beforehand. I remember Sid not, you know, being kind of displaying the kind of body language that said, you know, I don't really want to, I'm not here. Uh, I remember I had on a pair of jeans with a lot of patches on, I think, that Jenny had done, all different coloured patches. Uh, I remember having a Marshall bass amp. I remember playing, I think we did some quite long jams. And then, and I remember looking across at Sid and just thinking, you don't want to be here, do you? You just wish you weren't here. That's, well, that's, that was, you know, he was, he was kind of like going through the motions. He was singing off the mic. He wasn't even, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't, you know, the mic was here and he just sort of be singing like this. And, you know, he, he just, didn't want to be there, and and I remember feeling he's the lead guitarist and lead singer, and it's very hard to make this work because, you know, he's he's a very he's probably the most important member of the band, and he he doesn't want to be here. And I remember it 
being hugely anticlimactic. I remember it sort of petering out. I don't remember who stopped first or, you know, whether anybody, maybe whether anybody walked off. I just don't remember. I know that in one of the reports of the gig, it said my bass amp blew up. Blew up. Uh, I don't remember that, but that's more than possible. Um, just remember the huge sense of anticlimax and a feeling that we just couldn't meet the expectations and just <clears throat> feeling that I'd let people down. Um, and I just wanted to go away and forget about it and do something else. The audience? Audience were quite, yeah, were quite a good number of people there. They weren't booing. No, they weren't booing, but I think you could tell that, you know, everybody just knew that it had, the wheels had come off, you know, that it was, you know, you were just witnessing, you know, a break, the breakdown of a, of someone in performance, you know, that, I mean, whether it was a personal breakdown or not, I, I it was certainly a, a performance breakdown, you know, it just wasn't happening, it, it wasn't good, and everybody, you could, that was quite, tangible and clear to everybody include and you know yeah so I just felt yeah this is terrible because we've let people down we you know we, it's everybody was looking forward to it and a lot of expectation and we hadn't we hadn't uh, risen to it and yeah so it was uh, it was a bad one it was Probably that the worst sort of feeling uh, uh, that I've had at the end of a bad gig ever, and I, I, you know, I have some gigs are good and some are bad, some are really bad, and that was probably the worst that I've ever done. What about the Melody Maker review that came out? It was, you know, it was just. Very unlucky that the Melody Maker had come to that gig. It was the worst possible gig they could have come to. You know, if um, I suppose, you know, with hindsight, you'd say, well, we just weren't ready for it. You know, we had, we'd done a few local low pressure gigs, um, you know, or gigs with no pressure really. Um, and although this wasn't, you know, exactly a, a high profile gig, I mean, it was still local, but it was a high profile gig. And, you know, the melody maker were there to, to see it. And so, <clears throat> you know, there was no hiding place from that. And I, I yeah, uh, you know, I remember it coming out and thinking, well, that's about, that's about right. That's more or less what happened. It must have been actually, must have been pretty dire for you because like, you know, although Sid used to reviews in the melody maker with Pink Floyd, mm. I mean, Melody Maker coming to Cambridge it's quite an event isn't it really for a, a local musician yeah I mean I, I had been living in London and I had been playing in London quite a bit and I had toured nationally with um, the blues band Delivery and we'd done um, uh, we'd been playing in our own right and also backing some blues artists um, so you know I wasn't it wasn't it didn't seem that I wasn't I wasn't sort of completely in awe of it in that sense but um I was just sorry that they'd picked that gig to come to really and I you know I think you know with hindsight as I say we just weren't ready for it or you know and maybe subsequently events have shown that you know perhaps that, that Sid you know would wasn't wouldn't wouldn't ever be ready for it again I I I you know hope I'm wrong but you know I I, I don't think he's sort of shown that he wants to play anymore and um, I believe that's the last kind of public appearance he made I'm, but I don't know for sure. You know, I think the only thing I, um, I would say and I'd like to, you know, say that uh, I, I remember admiring Sid tremendously because you really felt that it was here was someone who was out on the edge, who was putting everything, including their own personal well-being, into their work and their art, and that you know if if he if that didn't if that failed, then 
he went down with it sort of thing there was you know he didn't have a safety net and I, and I, I was you know I think that was in, inspirational because you know, you just felt that this here was someone who was totally committed to to his work. And um, as I say, you know, he he just put everything into it. And he, he, you know, in his whole life and his whole being, I think. Uh, so he was like yeah. living, living uh, the artist. He was actually living it out. I do. I do remember having that impression that you know that here was someone who you know who. Yeah, I think I'm repeating myself, but. Yeah, who? who that's right. You know. Yeah, he he was an artist. He was absolutely. An artist. But, mm. I, was, I just certainly remember having a very strong sense of. Him almost being, you know, perhaps exp um, using himself as a sort of guinea pig or, or I, uh, that's, that's putting it too strongly, but that, you know, that any, that he would use any, any experience or any feeling, you know, and, and, and he would go to any lengths to get that experience and, and, you know, and yeah, he would, I mean, because he was also a very good painter. Um, and I just, yeah, just having this impression of someone who was totally devoted to their creativity and, you know, not, not allowing anything to stand in its way and, yeah, just sort of just being out there on the edge. Was it quite scary in a way being, being with, with him in the sense that he's, if you're on the edge? No, it, it wasn't scary for me, but I, I remember feeling that he was very brave, you know, that he... Um, you know that it was a brave thing that he was doing because, yeah, you, you know he he <clears throat> he didn't have any kind of safety net. What well, what's um, your abiding sort of impression of him uh, as a as a musician? And as a musician, um, he had this beautiful black. Telecaster with a kind of white inlay, maple neck, um, you know, like a white, a very light coloured neck. Uh, he wasn't a, a virtuoso, <clears throat> and I, 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 I don't imagine that he kind of practised what you might call practice, um, but he, he was tremendously imaginative. You know, I think he... Yeah, I mean, he could play. Uh, I think his playing was, I would describe it as, his guitar playing as compositional. You know, he'd, um, he'd play, the, he'd use the guitar to express a musical idea and, you know, a lyrical idea, a lyric idea. Um, so I wouldn't have said that he was a brilliant sort of technical guitarist, but yeah, he had a good feel, good sound. Um, you know, he was he was uh, professional in the sense that he he played he could um, play the guitar well enough to to express what he wanted to express and um, you know I think uh, that's you know he'd certainly he'd ha do unexpected things on the guitar you know he'd perhaps play just the way especially he'd do sort of, I don't know, some of the, you know, changes where he'll just go from a major chord, just just slide down to a, this, I don't know, another major chord just immediately below it. It's not, you know, it, it's kind of contrary to, to normal kind of musical sort of practice, but he made it work, you know, and um, that, I think, you know, that, that yeah, he's, uh, he, com he communicated a, a total sort of musical vision, you know, and a creative vision. Okay.